International Day for Universal. Pour fêter la Journée internationale pour l'accès universel aux informations, faites partie de l'UNESCO pour euh, améliorer la situation. Grâce à cette journée, nous allons en fait euh, mettre en relief les informations et la mise en œuvre pour construire des institutions inclusives et responsables. En tant que euh, droit fondamental humain, l'accès la, euh, aux informations est un pilier pour la connaissance et cela améliore la transparence et la gouvernance. Cela protège notre santé, réduit les inégalités et contribue au développement durable. Le 28 et le 29 septembre, venez participer à nos séries de webinaires et les événements organisés par l'UNESCO et les partenaires partout dans le monde afin de protéger et euh, faire valoir nos droits de l'information. N'hésitez surtout pas à se rendre sur le site web pour davantage d'informations. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est un immense plaisir pour moi de vous voir tous. Nous avons vraiment une séance très intéressante qui est prévue. Cette séance penche sur comment les REL pourraient renforcer l'accès à l'information. Comme vous le savez, euh, aujourd'hui, c'est la journée internationale pour l'accès universel aux informations. Et euh, quelque chose à laquelle on, a, euh, à laquelle on ne pense pas, c'est les droits d'auteur. Le rôle des ressources euh, éducatives libres qui sont disponibles sous licence libre, c'est-à-dire qu'on peut partager, on peut réutiliser et on peut également adapter les ressources éducatives dans le domaine public. Donc, nous avons vraiment euh, des, une présentation très intéressante. Voici le format. Il y aura trois questions qui seront posées sur comment euh, les, re, les recommandations de l'UNESCO sur les ressources euh, éducatives libres euh, facilitent l'accès à la coopération internationale pour euh, l'accès universel et quels sont les exemples de bonnes pratiques Nous avons prévu une séance interactive. Nous avons trois spécialistes avec nous et nous avons Dr Dirk Van Dam qui est en fait le propriétaire de DVD U Consult. C'est un chercheur pour le centre de curriculum et c'est en fait l'ancien directeur le directeur retraité de série de l'OCDE. Nous avons Caroline Bogatache qui est en Botera, qui est en fait euh, le président de Commons et qui est aussi le directeur exécutif de la société colombienne de droits euh, d'auteur. Nous avons également Maya Bogatache qui est en fait fondatrice et chef de de l'Institut de la propriété intellectuelle de la Slovénie. Donc, je vais donner en fait ma je vais donner la parole à ma collègue Aïssa Tou qui va donner une petite introduction aux euh, ressources éducatives libres. Aïssa Tou, vous avez la parole. Merci. Je vais donc faire la, la, une présentation de la recommandation de l'UNESCO sur les REL euh, en essayant de mettre l'accent sur les aspects juridiques euh, liés aux ressources éducatives libres. Mais euh, pour commencer, on essaiera donc à travers cette présentation d'explorer de, le cadre juridique lié aux ressources éducatives libres, notamment les droits d'auteur et l'invitation qui est faite aux États membres et aux institutions à travers les recommandations, la recommandation à mettre en place des cadres juridiques ou politiques favorables au développement des REL de qualité conformément aux obligations nationales et internationales en la matière. On va d'abord euh, se poser de, la question de savoir qu'est-ce qu'une recommandation. Alors, la recommandation de l'UNESCO sur les REL, euh, la recommandation au sens de l'UNESCO est entendue comme euh, un des principaux instruments normatifs de l'UNESCO, au même titre que les conventions et les décisions. La recommandation va être l'instrument normatif par lequel l'organisation va édicter des principes directeurs et des normes aux États membres sur les mesures qui pourraient être prises dans un domaine donné et à charge pour les États membres de, faire régulièrement, enfin de fournir régulièrement des rapports sur l'état de la mise en œuvre de ces mesures. 
Il faut savoir aussi que la recommandation va présenter euh, la souplesse nécessaire pour être rapidement euh, adaptée à l'évolution technologique constante dans un domaine donné. Il n'y a pas des centaines et des centaines de recommandations de, de, de la part de l'UNESCO. Juste pour vous donner des chiffres, de 1956 à nos jours, euh, l'UNESCO n'a a adopté que euh, 33, 35 recommandations pardon, et des années 2000 à maintenant, le nombre de recommandations adoptées n'est qu'au nombre de 8. Alors, euh, pour en venir à l'objet de la recommandation de l'UNESCO, les ressources éducatives libres, euh, elles sont définies par la recommandation comme, tout, comme des matériels euh, d'apprentissage, d'enseignement et de recherche, surtout format et support, euh, relevant du domaine public ou protégé par le droit d'auteur, et, et publiés sous une licence ouverte qui autorise donc leur consultation, leur réutilisation, leurs utilisations à d'autres fins, leur adaptation et leur redistribution gratuite par d'autres. La recommandation également définit euh, ce que c'est les, les licences ouvertes. C'est donc des licences qui respectent les droits de la propriété intellectuelle de leur auteur et qui accordent au public des, des autorisations de consulter, de réutiliser, d'utiliser à d'autres fins, d'adapter et de redistribuer des matériels éducatifs. Next slide. Euh, la recommandation identifie une panoplie de parties prenantes, mais on va, on va euh, aller directement sur la prochaine slide. La recommandation pardon, identifie euh, un certain nombre d'objectifs et de domaines d'action. Donc, les domaines d'action euh, sont au nombre de cinq. Il y a le renforcement des capacités en matière de REL, il y a le développement de politiques euh, de soutien des REL. Il y a tout ce qui a lieu, euh, lien au développement de REL euh, accessible, inclusif, de qualité. Il y a aussi ce qui est lié à la durabilité des ressources éducatives libres. Et enfin, il y a le renforcement de la coopération internationale. Alors, pour en venir à, à la question qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui, euh, précisément sur la question de savoir comment les, les ressources éducatives libres participent au renforcement de l'accès à l'information à, à, à et aussi euh, comment mettre ça en lien avec le thème de la célébration de la journée euh, internationale de l'accès universel à l'information et le thème euh, de cette année qui est de construire en mieux avec le droit d'accès à l'information. On peut trouver des éléments de réponse. D'abord, on verra qu'à travers euh, les domaines d'action de la recommandation, il y a un certain nombre de mesures sur lesquelles les États membres peuvent s'inspirer pour la mise en œuvre, dont certaines visent à instaurer des cadres juridiques, politiques et réglementaires favorables ou propices au développement de règles. Donc, si on s'intéresse à cette slide, pour le premier domaine d'action, la, la recommandation invite les États membres à renforcer les capacités pour utiliser et appliquer des licences ouvertes conformément aux législations nationales et aux obligations internationales relatives aux droits d'auteur mais aussi à sensibiliser sur les exceptions et les limitations à l'utilisation d'œuvres protégées par, le, par les droits d'auteur à des fins pédagogiques ou de recherche. Concernant le, de, le deuxième domaine d'action, euh, la, recommandation, la recommandation demande de développer et d'adopter des normes qui mettent l'accent sur l'examen des ressources éducatives, qu'elles soient en licence ouverte ou non. Également, sur le troisième domaine d'action, elle euh, demande l'adoption de cadres réglementaires en faveur de l'élaboration de produits de REL et de services connexes qui, sont, qui soient conformes aux normes nationales et internationales, ainsi qu'aux intérêts et aux valeurs des parties prenantes. En ce qui concerne les politiques, la recommandation demande la conception et la mise en œuvre de cadres réglementaires qui encouragent la mise à disposition sous licence ouverte ou dans le domaine public des ressources éducatives libres élaborées grâce à des fonds publics, mais aussi d'encourager les institutions à élaborer ou actualiser des cadres juridiques ou politiques permettant le développement de règles de qualité par des éducateurs et des apprenants dans le respect des législations nationales et des obligations relatives aux droits d'auteur. Mais le domaine d'action 5 va plus loin, vu que euh, la recommandation à travers sa, euh, ce domaine d'action demande même la possibilité de mettre en place un cadre international concernant les exceptions et les limitations aux droits d'auteur à des fins pédagogiques et de recherche. Euh, deuxièmement, les REL ont permis au système éducatif, c'est un deuxième élément de réponse euh, sur la question de savoir comment les REL peuvent renforcer euh, l'accès à l'information. Donc, on n'est pas sans savoir que les REL ont permis au système éducatif d'être 
euh, résilient face à la crise de la COVID-19. Donc, les REL ont permis de soutenir euh, l'apprentissage et le partage de connaissances pendant la pandémie qui a perturbé l'apprentissage et qui a, euh, à son pic, atteint 1,7 milliard d'apprenants dans 191 pays. Euh, C'est dans cette perspective qu'il y a une action commune qui a émergé et qui vise à gérer les défis de, de la crise pandémique et de celle à venir pour les apprenants et ainsi à jeter les bases d'une intégration systématique des meilleures pratiques afin d'accroître le partage des connaissances pour l'avenir de l'apprentissage post-COVID. En définitive, on peut euh, retenir que les REL euh, contribuent à la promotion des lois sur l'accès à, à l'information, car la recommandation appelle à tirer profit des licences ouvertes, à euh, renforcer les capacités dans l'utilisation des licences ouvertes, à l'application sur le droit d'auteur conformément aux lois et réglementations nationales, mais aussi à l'utilisation de données numériques et ouvertes dans les REL, tout en plaidant pour un assouplissement des cadres juridiques liés aux droits d'auteur. Et par ailleurs, les REL ont permis, de, euh, ont permis et continuent de rendre possible l'éducation en période de crise grâce à l'enseignement en ligne et à distance. C'est donc un grand avancement dans l'accès à l'information et au savoir, et ça contribue à la création de sociétés de savoir inclusives et participatives. L'idée donc, c'est que dans les prochaines présentations, on, approfond... on essaie d'approfondir un peu plus ces questions. Euh, J'arrive donc au terme de ma présentation. With that, I'm going to hand over to Zainab, who will moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asati. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we're ready to start. We have, uh, I have introduced our speakers already, Dr. Dirk Van Dam. Ms. Caroline Botero and Dr. Maya Bogatich Jantish. Um, I will, the first question I will uh, address towards uh, Dirk and Carolina. Dirk, how does the UNESCO OER recommendation enhance international cooperation for universal access to information? Dirk, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Zainab. Um, I think, first of all, it's it's very important to say that the UNESCO declaration or recommendation is a Im very important and powerful tool uh, for countries and for the international community. Um, it is highly political relevant. It is of high symbolic value. Um, so it's very important that the recommendation exists. But I must admit that uh, maybe I, I don't have a complete view of all the countries in the world, but that the real impact on policies is still yet uh, to be improved. Um, we don't see a lot of countries really referring to the recommendation when making uh, OER policies. Um, OER has received an incredibly important push during the COVID-19 pandemic, that's for sure. Uh, countries and, and systems and teachers, schools had to just from one day to another um, in March uh, 2020 to switch to digital resources to support learning from distance education when schools were closed. Um, and some of them have um, well, used OER, um, but many teachers did not use OER because they didn't have the regulatory framework in place uh, on, a, on a system level, on a national level for them to, to use OER. Um, so that was a bit disappointing um, when I see it in my own country and the Flemish community of Belgium. Um, many teachers just started to to develop their own resources and to put things on the web uh, in a very uncoordinated, almost chaotic way. Um, and only a few of them really relied on, on digital resources, which have been proven of high quality and with the necessary licenses. So the real open educational resources. Um, I, th I firmly believe and I hope that the pandemic and the experiences that uh, many systems have gone through um, will now provide an opportunity for countries to think seriously about a, a systemic approach to openness in education um, and to um, uh, a real development of OER databases, repositories, 
um, in many languages, in many uh, cultural um, arenas. Um, I think this is uh, hugely important. We still have to recognize that there is a lot of resistance and a lot of um, counter uh, productive forces. Eh? So the educational publishers, they still seem to think that open educational resources are a direct threat to their business model. Um, I see it also in my country and in the Netherlands and in some other European countries where um, the uh, educational resources are increasingly monopolized by the publishing firms um, and that uh, initiatives, often grassroots initiatives uh, led by teachers themselves, which uh, try to develop OER and try to uh, make everything accessible and available to as many schools as possible, that these initiatives have a very hard time to survive and to have a real impact. So my overall assessment is very positive on the deck, on the recommendation. I think it's hugely important. Uh, I would not wish it to go away or whatever. Um, but there is still a lot of work to be done. And I think uh, we have to think of, of strategies to um, convince education policymakers, ministers, who are often not really aware that this recommendation exists. We have to convince them uh, of, the, of the importance um, and of uh, the opportunities after the COVID-19 pandemic to, to improve the situation. Um, so far, my first um, intervention, which is mixed in tone, but I think um, from my perspective, this is what is happening today. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you for a very pragmatic response. And I think uh, Dirk has been in this field for a very long time also, and uh, I think you've seen the evolution. And it's, uh, it's, very, it's a great pleasure to have this feedback after all this time of how the, the evolutions. Um, Carolina, could I ask for your feedback? How would you do the question? Uh, first of all, thank you for this invitation to be part of the, of the meeting today. I can only agree with my pre the previous speaker on the importance of the, of the declaration and would like to provide some, uh, uh, some proof, let's say, from another side of the world of, on how, how it is important to really implement the declaration. Uh, during the COVID-19, uh, we all know how much, the, how much, how was the impact to education. In Latin America, distant learning is, uh, was, was deployed by the governments, but distance learning is only possible with the internet connection and devices. I have to say that according to some statistics, 46% 46, 46 of the children between age five and 12 live in households without internet connection. Only 10 to 20% of those that are from the lowest income families will have any kind of this, do not have any kind of, de of devices compared to 70 to 80% of uh, children from more wealthy families that will have a laptop at home. This means that uh, the situation was very hard to, hard to deploy distance learning. 23 out of 29 countries in Latin America deployed other strategies such as TV or broadcast, but uh, and even printed guides that were, were distributed all along the countries. Only eight countries will, were able to distribute devices for the children. Uh, about the connectivity, the differences in Latin America between urban and rural are very significant. Again, children between five and 12 are among those that less uh, connect, that, that has less connectivity. And I have to add that mobile brand, broadband penetration is five times higher than um, broadband, fixed broadband. But 67% of the countries does not have adequate mobile download speed. That is to say, even if they are connected, distance learning is not possible due to connectivity. So low connections speeds are reinforcing exclusion, preventing teleworking and distance learning. Often families will have to decide whether to do telework or uh, education. This is why the UNESCO declaration and especially the copyright provisions under the UNESCO declaration are so important because uh, they allow the, the 
educational resources to be able to be localized. They can be uh, created, but also access, reuse, repurposed, adapted, redistributed, created, and, uh, and therefore localized to, uh, to better serve the, the needs of education. Emergen emergencies such as the COVID-19 has shown us that the response for governments requires speed. And this can only be provided today because of OER, just because as, as my pre that the previous speaker said, if there are not enough local um, provisions, legislation pro provisions, this will be the only way. Uh, the digital divide gap is the worst probably uh, situation that uh, a country has to face, but it puts in the worst place the rural children. For them, there is a need to fastly do something. And uh, this need a local solution. During COVID, many countries, for instance, Colombia, produced for the first time in their lives, probably, or at least in the last century, produced a printed guide to distribute where there was no connection or bad connection. But it was never deployed thinking on openness. So we lost an opportunity to, to do this process of thinking. Secondly, uh, the, in those places where there is bad connection or uh, non-connectivity at all, there are crafted solutions that can be deployed, such as local networks or community network. But what we know is that devices that will be used are mobile. So every kind of educational resources that are deployed that are basically for distance learning are not thinking about these different format that it needs to be um, repurposes, relocalized. This is why OERs are so important. I would uh, like to finish just saying that for me, the, the emergency was a great opportunity for OER, but I still think that at least in Latin America, uh, we are pending the discussion about how to better promote the objectives and areas of action of the UNESCO declaration to understand how OER can really impact on issues of education and emergencies. I would leave it this way for now and wait for the next question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I just I want to just summarize the two interventions because I think you've you've done you've spoken on two sides of the same coin to some degree. Dirk, you've talked about the need for capacity building and sustainability, and for ministers to understand what the recommendation is in order to be able to implement it in the countries in a more systematic manner. And I think that's really important because it's, these are points which have come up, they're, they're action points in the recommendation itself, but the role of ministers to understand how to actually have a systematic means of implementing is, uh, is a very um, strategic uh, step forward. Caroline, I think what's really interesting is that you've also spoken about capacity building sustainability and also uh, connectivity per se, especially in Latin America. And you're, you spoke about the need for adaptation and adoption of uh, and contextualization. And I think the point that you raised is not one that we often hear in the discussions about the fact that when you're contextualizing, you also have to think from a technical point of view. And it's true that mobile devices are much more widespread than, than others. And there has to be a way to, um, to ensure that they are able to be repurposed. And I think it comes back to the same point that there needs to be greater, it's, it was a great opportunity, it was a tragic event, the pandemic on different fronts and a sanitary front on a human front. But at the same time with the with what happened with online learning, it made everyone realize that there is such a thing called online learning and it's necessary and overnight everyone had to just figure out what to do. But there needs to be more capacity building, it was very clear that there needs to be more understanding on how to actually use open educational resources and what is the added value of it and as you your the your um, your example of teachers who had to uh, who had the opportunity to actually develop materials they had to they, the licensing capacity building is very important also so there is a need for further understanding of the concept and a further top down and bottom up approach thank you very much for these really enlightening points i'd like to go to the second question um, which is what can be done to support the development and enhancement of legal and regulatory 
frameworks on copyright and policies for OER development. So we're talking about frameworks which are both national and institutional. And with that, I give the floor to Maya. Maya, would you like to take the respond first? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Zainab. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this interesting panel. I see many familiar places that are currently sitting far away and we are just, we are just uh, uh, communicating and talking about such important topics uh, online. But um, first of all, OER recommendation is essential to put some pressure on politicians who are thinking about this topic is, is a great excuse, I will use this word, to do something, to start to do actions. Slovenia uh, did some important steps uh, on the topic of open educational resources, but of course, more can be done. I've been uh, always. And um, the end result is good quality open education or good quality education. So uh, open educational resources can contribute to that tremendously, but also like very good and balanced copyright system as well. So um, I've, I've been involved in open content licenses as a copyright expert for more than two decades now. And we've been repeating some important um, issues that need to be done for a couple of years. And in a way pandemic did like quick quick push that some things should start to move faster or offered some proofs that what we were saying for more and more years, it's really important to, to do. So that's why I would like to represent to this distinguished audience, a study that we did uh, earlier this year, a study, study is remote education during the pandemic teacher's perspective um, I kindly suggest um, to, to, to colleagues from UNESCO to put the link and the name of this study in the chat that every, every participant will be able to, to click on that study and see the data because the data is really important. But I will talk about this data. So the, the study was conducted by Centrum Cifro from Poland and Comunia. I'm a member of Comunia uh, as a part of Copyright for Education project. The authors, I need to do that. I'm a copyright expert of the study are Magdalena Birna, Agnieszka Urbanska, Teresa Nobre, Alek Trakowski, and myself. The, the important thing about the study is that the report and recommendations are based on a European, European questionnaire-based study. We carried on the survey in seven member states. More than 100, 600 teachers uh, were included and the study methodology and everything is OER is openly licensed, so everyone who wants to who wants to uh, do similar study somewhere else and collect that data somewhere else or upgrade the study, do derivative of this study is more than welcome to to do to do that. And so, what were the conclusions and recommendations? I will quickly go through all, and while I'll do that, I will also answer the questions. I know. So. Three recommendation conclusions and recommendations who deal more on on the top who deal more are important regarding the copyright balance or the how should copyright change. So we we discovered or the data shows that teachers use content that that primarily folk functions outside of the educational market. What does this mean? They use materials that are not primarily. Um, targeted for educational market. So not materials that are primarily prepared uh, by educational publishers. So when, what, what I have on my mind, when the online education was moved online, teachers started to use materials that are out there and repurpose those materials to do illustrative example in class. And of course they prefer freely available materials online without payment. And more than half of the materials that they used, or more than half of the teachers that they, they used, they used open educational resources. So material licensed openly. That's, that's the data that shows, that, sh that demonstrates that. It's very important so that teachers repurpose a wide range of copyrighted works for remote education. And so it is, it is important to ensure that the copyright systems are designed in a way that they would be able to do that without any additional payment or any additional requirements. This, of course, is important for 
every region on the world who is who is doing copyright reform. We are talking about broad, clear copyright exceptions for education without remuneration. That's very relevant in Europe right now, but of course will is always very relevant globally as well. So that the copyright system supports public education. Uh, our finding was also that the teachers' informal collaboration played a significant role during the pandemic and constituted one of the key pillars of online teaching. Uh, online teaching in Europe without that would not be possible. And teachers exchange materials and also knowledge. So the first contact for was their peer network. And they, of course, use materials that they prepare themselves or other teachers prepare. And those mat material is more, more or less open educational resource. So now I'm answering the questions. It's important to, to support these informal collaborations on many levels. So by building suitable tools that enable cooperation, by reducing legal uncertainty, which can prevent teachers from creating and modifying materials, by reducing barriers in access to online resources, and of course, by strategical support of the development of cooperation and exchange uh, and, change, and exchange competence among teachers. I think something similar that already Dirk was, uh, Dr. Dirk was talking, talking about. The next finding was also that teachers mostly depend on tools delivered by the biggest tech companies. So why is this important to highlight? Because it's important to provide that uh, behavior of these biggest tech companies will not disable collaboration, communication in, in the future. So it, it, it can be an antitrust issue and should be carefully monitored, monitored in the future. This is also extremely relevant for the, from the perspective of collect, collection of data. Massive quantity of data was collected in this uh, pandemic year. And for Finale, the remote education was to a great extent supported by open educational resources. And I, I'm talking about seven European countries. So these are countries that are uh, well developed and let's say that the access to broadband was less or to technology was less of a problem than access and reuse of resources. And in, that, in this environment, open educational resources were essential part of the content that was used in education. And this, like, this is uh, proof that this is extremely important. So, and this was possible because the policies from the past enabled to create open educational resources. So it's of course important and crucial for the future to uh, bring these policies further and deeper to support the development of high quality open resources and practices. Uh, and, and so I, this is for, for now, I, I can um, discuss in my next intervention what, how, how, what can be done in Europe to support this development. So thank you for now. Thank you very much. So I give the floor to Caroline. To, uh, to Caroline. Thank you very much. Um, so I will first totally agree on on what on all what was said by by Maya. Um, I would say that big cities and and probably the wealthiest part of Latin America will uh, have in, uh, basically the same scenario that that she was describing. However, I I will focus again on the effects of the pandemic since the, it affected and had a, a very big um, impact, a uh, bad impact in, in my region in Latin America. Uh, just a few months after the pandemic started, it was UNICEF, the one that highlighted that more than seven months into the pandemic, so that was last year, COVID-19 was putting on hold the education of over 137 million children in Latin America and the Caribbean. Children in the region, they said, have already lost an average four times more days of schooling compared to the rest of the world. While schools are, were gradually reopening in several parts of the world, the vast majority of classrooms in Latin America were still closed across the region. Over one third of all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean had yet to set a date for school reopening. That was at the beginning of this year. So um, 
I, I, I totally agree on the need for policy pressure and all the landscape that Maya described, but we continue to insist on the issue of the digital divide. That is not just connectivity, uh, it also has to do with the capacity to use an appropriate technology that are key elements. So again, um, the, the landscape, once you have connectivity, uh, you will start to look about on use and appropriation and the issues of, of teachers and so on are, are really important. However, the main problem I, I believe, or the main issue I believe, uh, according to legal, legal and regulatory landscape in Latin America, America that has to be addressed is a very um, close uh, regulatory framework. In a study done by Datisop from, Lat from Uruguay, about eight countries in Latin America, they found that six countries in Latin America had no exception that could be used for, uh, the, for the remote education or distance education. That, that means that in these countries, unless you had OER, there was nothing to do. And again, if OERs were not deployed because the connectivity was not good, just think that only, um, only eight countries out of the 27 that that the that uh, were looked by Sir but Elalc in the previous uh, statistics I told you had any kind of um, open educational resource repository done by public policies. That is to say, there was really very little OER. So my first point would be that there is a need to rethink the regulatory framework to make it more open. Uh, because openness is not just about OERs, but also regulatory frameworks that are uh, open. Another study done by the PIGIP from the American University on the right to research uh, in international copyright law found that fewer than 25% of the world countries had, uh, any had a good exceptional limitation for the right to research. That is to say that permits reproduction and sharing of material for all research purposes. And any of those countries is in Latin America. We in Latin America then are in a very close environment on the issues of research that we have to do with education in the universities. For instance, in one in the research, they mentioned how one of the students in Sao Paulo said that the copyright protections have prevented him from using data mining methods for biomedical research. If a resource is not explicitly under an open license, I would not be able to use it properly in text mining projects for fear or of legal issues. Again, the, the main problem then is that we have a legal landscape that does not allow us to do properly uh, the activities of education, whether we speak on elementary, high school, or university. And this means that there is a need to rethink the legal and, and regulatory framework in the region, uh, the, this, the position of our countries on the, on the copyright waivers for emergencies at WTO or the agenda of copyright flexibilities on the WIPO also shows how, how we, we still need to um, do more pressure on policy, uh, just to echo what Nadia said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much. And thank you also to Maya. And the main points from what I, I, I noted while you were speaking is that, first of all, in the study, it was found that when the connectivity is there, when the legal framework is in place, teachers are able to actually use OER effectively. And I think what's really interesting is a point that you made earlier about the fact that teachers and their informal collaboration. And because this is a point that comes up often in the debates, they say, well, teachers don't want to share their information, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, you've shown in the study that teachers do want to collaborate. Teachers do want to use OER. And when the conditions are correct, then it's, uh, then, then it's really possible to go very far with it. Um, the issue of copyright ex exceptions for education came up in both uh, both presentations, and I think it's something that has to be discussed a bit further. It's part of the, the copyright law discussions that are happening in the European framework and also in other parts of the world. Um, uh, then the, the both uh, speakers speaking from two different parts of the world and the Atlantic Ocean between the two pointed out the need for, uh, for ensuring that the legal conditions are favorable for teachers and learners to use OER. And that means that they have to be, there has to be 
a reduction of the barriers and a reduction of legal uncertainty of, of actually doing so and uh, strategic support for this from a higher governmental level also. I think the, the studies that you spoke about that saying that the fact that the digital divide is both in capacity and with the, um, with the connectivity is an important point to, be, to really underscore and that the legal, legal landscape has to be favorable for us to be able to, for, for learning to happen in an open framework. And uh, thank you very much. So I will go on to question three. Um, I will ask Maya first, um, what are the examples of good practices, challenges and solutions where OER has supported the right to information and the building of inclusive knowledge societies? Dirk, can I give you the floor? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Zeynep. Um, if you ask me about good practices, <clears throat> I would say from my yeah, uh, view of the situation, and I have not been able to do um, really uh, some additional research on this, but what brings me to what, what comes to my mind is still this, the, the same kind of organizations and initiatives that are in existence since, let's say, five, six, seven years. Um, Creative Commons, of course, uh, national initiatives in, in the Netherlands, in Poland, and many other in many other countries. Um, but what bothers me is, and I don't know whether it really falls under the label of good practices, is that there is a lot of, there is a huge gray zone of teachers working with all kinds of resources um, and, and adapting them to their own needs, uh, reusing them, uh, working together, um, often under the surface of what we officially or legally call open educational resources under the surface of uh, licensing. Um, and I think the, in the COVID pandemic, um, many teachers have increased their collaboration with colleagues. So there is a huge, uh, there is a kind of sea of um, untapped uh, opportunity there, uh, a gray zone, which we are not able to see through our uh, normal systems um, and that's um, that's reassuring on the one hand and that's very positive on the other hand it's a bit um, worrisome because um, yeah from a legal point of view um, they are not existing um, and I, I know teachers who use open educational resources because they are often high quality um, but they are not um, yeah, meeting the requirements of, uh, of licensing, um, adapted versions of it. Um, sometimes the burden, the legal burden, the licensing burden is sometimes too high for individual teachers. So they just take it from the net, they, they use it, they reuse it, they adapt it to their own needs. They often sometimes share it within their groups of, of teachers in a certain discipline. Um, and that's it. Um, and I am hesitant to call that good practice. I think it's an, a very important uh, practice at the moment. It's maybe not the, the best practice, but it's, um, it, it exists. But I see that Maya is again with us. Yes, so um, maybe yeah. we should give her the floor first. Yes, Maya, would you like to take the floor? Okay. I think that the, the, the best example actually is how, for example, the study that I mentioned before, how open educational resources helped us to cope with pa pandemic. I mean, more than 50% of teachers use open educational resources. And I know that in Europe, um, publishers at the beginning of pandemia, pandemic, they were offering their materials for free, but even without payment. And, but even that did not change the importance of OER in this context. So I think this is the, the, the example how OER saved us in these very, very pressing times. I mean, whoever is building OER or contributing to OER is building a beautiful community who understands how it's important to share and help each other. But of course, for the end, I will say, although this is a very good example, we should not rely just on, on, on OER. This is just one, one 
the brother and the, the sister is a good balanced copyright system and OER recommendation addresses this as well. We should not just say that OER will say everything because it, they will not. It's important to have a good, effective, broad and unremunerated uh, exception for education. I mean, in Europe right now, it's in the final phase of the copyright reform, but if we see, for example, what Carolina said, Carolina said before, in Latin American countries, you rarely see uh, that a country with educational exception. Why is that? It seems I'm following the process at WIPO, which is uh, 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 from the same family as UNESCO, we must say. I mean, when at WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, the exceptions and limitations for public interests are discussed, the developed countries are not in favor of such exceptions and limitations. Why not? It's it probably because of the published publishers from those developed countries have something to say. So I'm, I'm bringing this up in this forum because it's extremely important. OER are important. UNESCO is doing great job with recommendation and this will give this will give important push to uh, to build build better policies i'm sorry for this noise but it's also extremely important to not just rely on oir but also like to continue to advocate to work for a balanced copyright system which in the case of education and research means operational uh, broad, clear exceptions for education and research. And we still need a long way to go there. And um, I'm very happy that UNESCO understands these issues because it's UNESCO is important. I, I, before I, I was talking about brother and sister, good balanced copyright system and OER, but not, let me now talk about cousins. If the UNESCO is cousin of WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, it would be good to discuss it to our, at the family dinner that for many, many countries globally, exceptions and limitations for education and research as well are extremely important. So thank you for giving me opportunity to, hope to bring this up. I will continue to follow this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us, especially from uh, your busy schedule in between planes. And uh, we greatly appreciate it, Maya. Just today, Zainab. Otherwise, I'm always available to discuss the importance of balanced copyright system and OR, especially if you and your team invites me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Karen, would you like to join? Uh, would you like to say some words? Sure, thank you very much for the opportunity. I would just like to say that um, precisely because in the foundation we've been working on the issues of connectivity in the rural areas. During the pandemic, uh, we were able to deploy in several places um, and as a small uh, local network that we use, it's, it's, uh, it's really very easy. We turn the computers of the libraries of, of rural schools or the teachers from rural schools, turn them into servers that provide a Wi-Fi signal that any uh, person with a device, mobile device or laptop or uh, tablet can access and everything that is on the computer will be available for them. This was a great solution in many places with low connectivity or non-connectivity at all. And it was possible because we were able to upload there a, a, a huge amount of content under the OER logic. So not just uh, the Wikipedia, but also many books and other uh, OERs that were available in Spanish. And we were also um, helping, uh, doing some kind of uh, support to these, to these teachers. And these turned out to be a great solution. Uh, in one of the schools, for instance, in Fresno, Tolima, a very, um, a coffee region with a lot of mountains and very bad connectivity, uh, the, the, the computers that were available at the school were sent to the houses of some of the, of the mothers of the students that, and become hubs of themselves in, in different uh, areas of the region, of the rural region. This was another good solution. And uh, there, mostly the connectivity would be done via WhatsApp. So the, the communication was between the students 
to the teacher, to the, to the computer of the mother, and the mother will do the connection to send the homeworks, for instance, or receive uh, uh, information from the teacher via WhatsApp. I'm just mentioning this because really the conditions of what could be said as remote, distant, uh, uh, remote or distant uh, education are very challenging. And none of the very nice and, and, and well-conceived uh, OERs will work. You need very easy things. And, not, and, and the truth is that this is still very good for the, for the students because otherwise the, all these uh, students will remain with no capacity to connect to technology. And this will leave them behind in the future of, of labor, for instance. So um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that even low tech uh, can, can be very well used and, and bring some, uh, some good, uh, some, some kind of technology education to underserved children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. So you've provided an example of a good practice that was done where basically a family created a hub using WhatsApp. While you're speaking, I'm thinking of all the things that WhatsApp has been able to do in the last several years, and it's really turned into quite a tool. Um, and thank you also, Maya, for sharing the information on the, uh, on the OER family and the copyright family and reminding us that we're actually part, there are a lot of people around this table and we have in, in this copyright family that we need to make sure are communicating with each other. And sometimes we, we talk about one child, but there are many children in the family. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting point that we often do not uh, address properly. We have a, a little bit of time, five minutes left in this program. We have two questions. Um, I think we have uh, the first one I'll read out loud and I'll just ask if anyone has any inputs to it. We see more MOOCs than OERs even by the universities. I see use of e-learning more than open learning. Um, I think there's a question about the licensing of MOOCs, MOOCs and the difference between e-learning and open learning. Would anybody like to respond? Ma, Caroline, please, you're shaking your head. So I think that means you want to talk. Well, uh, the, the second part, the e-learning and open learning. Yeah, there, there are lots of difference there. Um, of course, e-learning means that you are really, you are really using the, you're using technology and it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, the technology you're using, whereas open, open uh, uh, learning in the past was meant to be the distance learning. Um, right now, the issue of, of um, uh, of the legal uh, aspect had turned that uh, when you speak about openness, you're meaning uh, the that there there is an uh, there there is there are the three elements so technology, um, the legal aspect of of open licenses, and that you have uh, access for free. But I, I agree that there are many um, the 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 wordings are. Are, are changing and it could be confusing. Uh, again, e-learning is, uh, well, that's what I've learned during the years. E-learning is um, technology, is education that is being um, intermediated with technology, with different kinds of technologies. Open learning was in the past distance learning that could have or not uh, technology, but uh, when but right now there is the confusion because openness means the three elements as well of legal, economical, and technological uh, barriers are taken out for learning, and that would be my explanation of, of the differences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Dirk, would you like to add anything? Well, I think Maya was correct. I don't have anything to add. Um, uh, so the simple answer to the question is um, MOOCs are not always OERs and OERs are not always MOOCs, uh, but there is um, some overlap uh, between the two. Um, but it is true, as I read the, the, the question, the suggestion is true that uh, especially in higher education, open uh, resources are not really the preferred mode of developing uh, online content. 
Uh, so there was many universities who tried to develop their courses into, into MOOCs. Um, nothing against that, but it is a bit of a pity that they are not really embracing the OER philosophy, the licensing framework, and all the tools that is available in an OER environment. Um, so MOOCs are sometimes also uh, developed because of um, yeah, a commercial um, perspective. Um, even if the revenue generation by MOOCs is, is always very modest, um, but it would be, I think, uh, advisable for universities who want to engage in sharing their courses uh, online to really embrace uh, open educational resources frameworks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. And we have one last question, which is in French. I'll read it out loud in French and the interpreters can perhaps interpret it into English. Um, if you have, if you need the headset. Il y a beaucoup de réels disponibles. Comment sélectionner les plus crédibles et scientifiquement valables? Par exemple, quels réels en informatique ou en génie civil sont les meilleurs? So the question is about how to best, there are lots of OER available. How do you choose the most credible ones and the most scientifically val valid ones? Um, yes, go ahead, Derek. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, I, I really like this question. It, it's a really important one. Um, and it's one with which many people are suffering. When I speak to people, they are always very sympathetic to OER, but they always come back, how can I possibly select in, in the thousands of available resources um, what is high quality? So there is really a need for some intermediate organization, maybe it should not be a physical organization, but the kind of mechanism through which uh, the high quality resources are um, curated, made available. Uh, that's a very sensitive issue because in the OER world, um, quality assurance of open educational resources is still a little bit a sensitive topic. Um, but I, I really think we have to make advances in, in, in this area of uh, curating, quality assuring, maybe accrediting uh, resources uh, from a quality uh, perspective. Um, because users, it, it's not, the situation is not user friendly for the moment. And I see the, the question as an expression of this lack of user friendliness, which we have in, in the system right now. Thank you. Caroline, would you like to say anything? No, really, I totally agree with, with Dirk. Okay. Um, one thing that has come up on this question in the, in the other debates has been that open educational resources are educational resources. So in principle, they have to be at the same or, or above quality of resources which are, um, which are, which are licensed, fully licensed. So I think um, as we started the discussion, open educational resources are talking about, we're talking about the licensing matter at the heart. An open educational resource is defined as such because of its license. But at the same time, it's also an educational resource. And we mustn't think that because it's openly licensed, it has sort of a free pass to anything. So we have to, I think we have to also consider that it is, it has to go through the same process. It has to go through the same rigor as any other resource that's used in the classroom for learning. So it's, um, it has been brought up quite a bit in the debates also. So I think we're two minutes over time, but I would like to thank all of our speakers for their time and all of you, the participants. It's been a very long international day for universal access to information. In fact, it's been two days if you count it really chronologically. We've been celebrating since yesterday, so it's been a really long day. And I think we're the last webinar on this one. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank you very much, Caroline, Dirk, Maya, who's had to leave us, Isa, to the interpreters, the technicians, and um, thank you very much. And I wish you the very best, and we look forward to working with all of you very soon uh, on the next adventures that we have. With, uh, with our webinars and our other projects. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for also your insights into this uh, very interesting webinar. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.